That sounded promising. Good. Right. Um, in that case, I'm going to uh, kick off. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, January ORF. Well, January ORF meetings, because the first, because we're going to have a couple of other meetings as well uh, this month. Um, and uh, please wake, welcome uh, Dave Craig, who's going to talk to us about uh, STEM. Uh, the uh, Vicky, sorry, Becky was due to be um, hosting this event. She'd set this up. Unfortunately, she's had a, uh, a family emergency, so she's dashing to the hospital a bit of this, this, this afternoon. So she's out of circulation for the moment. So hope that all goes well. Um, but in the meantime, she's asked me just to uh, uh, carry on. So I feel heavily underprepared for this. So David, with the exception of uh, what I've just said and handing over to you, that's kind of the, that's largely my my contribution to the start of the meeting. Um, so uh, David, if you want to take over and um, yeah, um, that's fine. Neil, what what I could ask you to do, Neil, is keep an eye on the chat. Do that. Um, so I'll concentrate on my slides, and if you can, if there's anything interesting comes up or needs to be, you can you can intervene and say there's something going on I should know about. I'll okay, do, right. I'll so I'll uh, get some slides up here. Um, and if I can ask everybody else just to mute, it would be useful just to sort of keep background noise down. That'd be really handy. Yes, I mean I can't speak without slides, can I? I'd be I'd be completely unable to do that. So I'm talking about STEM and Orkney because Becky asked me to, um, and uh, I thought about how to talk about this and how long I could speak. Um, I work for the SCDI, that's the top left hand corner there of the of the slides. And I, I thought I should maybe ask you all to join the SCDI um, and pay your membership fees. Uh, but I decided that I didn't have time for that and it was it was a bit boring anyway. <clears throat> but you should know the SCDI is a, a membership organization and it's it's it lobbies the government um, about the right policies to support business. It's a bit like the CBI in England, but it's got a social element as well. So uh, it, it doesn't just look for maximum profit. It looks for uh, it looks for businesses with a purpose. Um, and part of the SCDI is the Young Engineers and Science Clubs. That's the uh, top right of the slide. Young Engineers and Science Clubs Scotland. Um, and really that's the SCDI saying one of the things that they identified many years ago was a shortage of uh, STEM skilled people in the workforce. And so rather than just complain to the government about it, they decided to do, to do something about it. And so they set up YESC to, uh, to encourage people to, to join in and uh, take up STEM careers for the good of the country. <clears throat> it, STEM, I think, came about rather in the same way as after the war, we planted lots of trees after the First World War. There was a, there was a feeling that, uh, that uh, the winners in the Second World War weren't just the bravest and the, uh, and the strongest. It was also the people who used science best. And then about 1960s and 70s, people realized that the countries that were most economically successful were building that success on science, technology, engineering, and maths. And there was a need to encourage people to go into the, these careers. And so that's where the, the acronym came from, science, technology, engineering, and maths. I was at one time one of my job titles was um, technology manager and so it was a bit a bit mysterious and I remember asking what technology was what's the difference between technology and engineering and I was given the answer is that technology is the same as engineering but it just doesn't quite work yet so that's the that's the group of subjects um, the artists have got annoyed with that and they've invented a thing called STEAM um, because they wanted to get in the bandwagon, but uh, I won't go into that for the moment. Anyway, David, so that's what STEM is. David, could a small yes. request, could you lower your microphone fractionally? You were getting a little bit of um, blowback with your... Ah, uh, yes. Oh, the easiest way is to move it away. How would that do? I think that's, I think that's better. We'll see how we go. Thank you. Yeah, okay, right. And just, we'll just put it down a bit. Then. 
that's that's good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so um, here's what I'll talk about, as well as explain what that is. Um, why do I think it's important for ORF and Orkney <clears throat> rather than just an interesting subject to witter on about? Um, and if you're interested, what is it? How do you go about it? And uh, What's the best way? So who am I? Um, why am I doing this? I started life as a physics teacher in Gordon's College in Aberdeen. That isn't actually me, that's Carlo Rovelli, but uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a physicist, he'll do. Um, and enjoyed that and uh, then moved on, not because I didn't like teaching, just, just moved on for, uh, for pastures new. So I was an engineer with umpteen different uh, firms, although I always sat at the same desk. I was owned by lots of firms like Ferranti and Marconi and British uh, Aerospace. Um, and this is the building I ended up in. You see all these typhoons and sticks outside, a bit naff, but uh, it showed you the sorts of stuff that we made. And then when I retired from that, uh, I, I joined up the with YESC and uh, started talking to kids about science um, and I suppose because I never really lost my love of teaching I wanted to get back and help teachers and schools and that sort of thing so that's that's where I'm where I'm coming from and uh, what my link with Orkney is I, we came to Orkney for a family holiday about 1997 I think first and uh, we came back every year after that for a family holiday and liked the place and uh, when we retired, we ended up just buying the house that we used to come to in holiday. So we've got a house in Orkney now and dividing our time between Orkney and uh, Edinburgh. So I'm going to start with the uh, science bit of that, something that um, I say to kids when I'm teaching them about science, when I'm trying to get them inspired in science, and that is that science starts and finishes with observations. So this is a graph that Neil uses quite a lot as well. So we're starting with observations. Um, and what we're observing here, measuring is the amount of carbon dioxide on top of a mountain in Hawaii um, against the, uh, the year, obviously. And as well as observation, here we're also looking at maths. And like all maths that I propound in schools, it's not hard. Um, making a graph is something that primary school kids are perfectly capable of. You don't need a brain the size of a planet. It's not difficult, it's a process. But what a process. Uh, Here's all that pile of numbers that's coming from the top of uh, that mountain. And just by spreading it out on a, on a piece of paper like that, suddenly it all becomes clear. And you can see, hey, it's good data. And look, it wiggles every year because it's different in summer and winter and all those, all those good things. Um, but of course, uh, there's this issue of COP. What is COP? Uh, well, I'm sure you know what COP is. And I put on my hat now as a as a, a reviewer, a, perhaps a design review. You know, when you get old and grizzled in an engineering firm, you end up doing reviews of people's projects. So suppose I was reviewing the COP project, or suppose you were, and you heard all the good slides and all the good words about it, and then you said, right, we're after doing really well, and uh, everybody else in the world is doing really well. And you thought, well, hold on. I'll just check. So you look at this graph and you squint one way and you squint the other way and you think, does anything that we're doing, has it made any difference at all? I would say, well, make up your own mind about that. Um, so part of the reason that ORF should be interested in STEM is because the world isn't doing something right yet. The world is not on track to fix this problem. Now, you can argue about the whys and wherefores, but the science says there's a problem and there's still a problem, so more needs to be done. You will have seen that young lady quite a lot, um, and uh, she's growing up too, unfortunately, but uh, 
This is something that she said to Andrew Marr um, just before the last COP. Um, he was saying, why don't you become a politician? And she said, well, okay, yeah. And, uh, but no. And the other point that was being brought up is, does she think some politicians get the problem? Really, I think she was saying is, yes, quite a lot of politicians have got the problem. But that's not good enough because if they, they they can only do what the public lets them do because they're voted in and out. So the job is that she was she was pointing out the job is not just to persuade the leaders. It's to, it it's has to be done on multiple levels, and that's what STEM's about, isn't it? That's a different level. We're not trying to persuade governments. We're not trying to persuade chief executives. We're trying to persuade everybody else in the world as well. And uh, the other thing, of course, is the reason that people listen to, to Greta is because she's a child. I mean, she's not now, but she, she's, she's past it. But uh, if you can get children to speak your message, then it's another string to your bow to get the message across. So that's, that's part of why uh, STEM is important to ORF. Then, Here's another aspect to it. Um, this is a long, boring report, uh, which you could imagine some skills development Scotland, looking at the the uh, the basics of uh, if we're going to do all these good things to fix the environment and build wind turbines and electric cars and all this good stuff, we're going to need a lot of people to do it. So this is a this is a a mega plan for where the skilled people are going to come from. And you can imagine that the starting point to a lot of this is STEM subjects, because the people that you need to do all these things here are not completely, not, not wholly, but largely STEM. And we need people to take up STEM careers and not just to shy away from them and say, oh, no, no, that's not for me. That's, that's, that's for... Uh, that's for people with big brains or people who like digging holes in the in the rain or drilling holes in, in metal. Um, so no, it's got to be we've got to we've got to divert people from taking up uh, careers in uh, oh I don't know um, financial wizardry in London or being being lawyers in uh, in Oxford. We would want them to just get stuck in there, and and contribute to the skilled workforce that we need in Scotland. So a big aspect of that is STEM. So again, that's something that ORF, I think, should be thinking about doing is saying, how are we going to contribute to creating the skilled workforce that's needed? Because uh, I've, I've just had a heat pump installed here in uh, my cottage in Newcote. And it struck me that we're going to need a heck of a lot of people in uh, installing heat pumps to do all the homes in Scotland. So uh, what a number of engineers are going to be needed it is absolutely mega. So um, just to, to summarize all that argument is um, if you want to have this in the near future, you're going to have to have that too. That is part of the equation. So, yes, I, I do really do think that ORF would be, would be rewarded by involving itself in STEM in some way. So supposing I have persuaded you of that, um, then how, how do you go about it? So here, here you go then, here's ORF, you're going to do something on STEM. So um, I often, worry about who my customer is. I used to do this as a teacher as well at Gordon's College. I had, I had parents who paid fees. I wondered if they were the customer. Sometimes they often thought they were the customer when they spoke to me. <laughs> um, I, I, wanted, I wanted it to be my pupils, of course. And then the head teacher thought he was he had a say as well in it as well. But so is ORF doing this for the benefit of Scotland or the world? Is that is that what you're trying to do? Or are you supporting teachers? Um, 
in particular, head teachers are a different kettle of fish from the class teachers and have a different uh, view in life, different, uh, different importance in, in the equation here. Um, sometimes you worry that you're, uh, you're banging on to children to do something they don't want to do, but um, if you imagine all those jobs that are going to be arising in the STEM subjects, then helping children to move into that field is helping them to move into a, into a, a, a job market. Um, so good for them, apart from making them better citizens, it's probably, probably good for them as well, but they will need to be involved in your thoughts. Um, employers, maybe you're running a firm that uh, needs to get more employer, more employees in the future. Maybe you're supporting um, people like Shell and Battenfall who are, who are looking to build a renewable future. Or maybe you have to get a grant like um, like us, the young engineers and science clubs live off grants and the people that give you grants think that they can control what you do with it. Um, that would apply to the uh, science festival as well, the Orkney Science Festival. Um, it's obviously part of the STEM drive too in, in, in its own way, um, but it, it gets a grant and it has to answer to other people. So, you want to think about, obviously, I don't think there's one answer to the question. Um, I feel quite strongly aligned with teachers, I suppose, because I used to be a teacher. And part of the reason I do this is because I feel I've learned something as an engineer. And I want to pass that back to teachers to, to help them. So if we think about teachers as an important customer, then one of the things you have to realize when you're dealing with teachers is they've got no time to prepare anything. Um, schools are very efficient. They're, I mean, people regard them sometimes as the, uh, the most efficient child minding service in the, in the country. Because uh, when the schools are off, what a panic there is to look after your, the kids at home. And people realize what a great job teachers do just getting the kids out of the way. Um, but a teacher might have 30 kids at a time. Uh, primary teacher, the amount of preparation time they get, if they have half an hour at the end of the day to tidy up and get themselves ready for the next day, they're doing well. Now, in, in business, uh, you're probably used to spending hours or days preparing a presentation like this. Heck, I, I mean, I started thinking about this in, well, a month ago. Uh, so that's that's the sort of preparation time that we think about. I know that obviously Neil can do everything in five minutes preparation time, but uh, don't, don't imagine that teachers have got time to, to prepare STEM work. So if you want to help a teacher with STEM work, don't expect them to put any time into this at all. You do all the legwork. If they need, if they need a box of matches, give them a box of matches. Yes, they could go to Tesco as well, but they don't have any time to do it. And don't ask them to go and buy a box of matches because they don't have any budget. The administration of schools just means there just isn't a budget to buy matches or toilet paper or anything like that. Um, like anywhere else, as you can imagine, teachers end up just buying these things themselves out of their own pocket. But you shouldn't imagine that the teacher can just say, oh yes, here's, here's five pounds on this and 50 pounds on that and I'll buy all the kit. So if any kit is needed, um, give it to the teachers. That's the way to support them. Um, however, um, oh, the, the other thing to say about, about helping teachers is Secondary teachers are subject specialists. So you don't really need to go and tell a secondary teacher uh, about physics and chemistry and maths because they're experts in that. Um, but you, you certainly can help them to make their subjects seem real 
because they they won't be so good at uh, why. I mean, I was a physics teacher, so why was physics important? Like that, it was difficult for me to see why physics was important to my children, particularly when they were going off to to uh, join their father's fishing boat or something like that. Um, so that's how to, how to help a secondary teacher with careers information and applications information. With primary teachers, well, a primary teacher is a non-specialist. They have to, they have to be they have to know enough about every subject under the sun because one teacher teaches everybody. So you can certainly help a primary teacher with your expertise in science and maths. Um, so that's that is very welcome. Um, they have no time to prepare, yes, and very little time to, for personal development. So how to use a computer? They just have to sort of hack it and wing it. Primary teachers are expected to teach languages. They're expected to teach kids about um, computers. But some of those teachers, remember, went into teaching 30 years ago. How, how are they supposed to keep up to date? So yes, they, they, they very much welcome support with the basics of what STEM subjects are about, as well as the applications. Anyway, moving on to what the teachers are really good at. If you're trying to work with children um, in a stem -y sort of way, don't try and organize the children yourself. The, uh, the how, to, how to herd cats is a skill that teachers are really good at. So work with a teacher if you're working with, with a class. So you can turn up with your balloons and and uh, you might make a huge, the huge mistake of handing out the balloons and then asking the children to do something. But as soon as you've blown up balloons and handed them out to a class, you've lost the class because they're all playing with the balloons. So the teacher will, will uh, help you with that side of it, the classroom management, how to manage children and uh, work with the teacher um, and uh, do the STEM bits yourself and let the teacher do the organizing the classroom bit. Um, another important thing is there's a lot of teachers, 250 of them in Orkney, full time. So if you think you can swan in and put in a few hours work here or there and make a difference to education in Orkney. Well, you can make a difference, but it's a very small difference. So um, we have to acknowledge that the vast majority of education is done by teachers and through teachers. So by all means, go and talk direct to kids, um, but also work to develop teachers' skills and confidence and interest in STEM subjects. Right. So um, how would you go about it? What's the first step? How, how might you get involved? I think you couldn't do worse than uh, get involved with STEM ambassadors. And uh, in Scotland, they're organized by CERC. S-S-E-R-C, that's, it used to just be the Scottish uh, Science Equipment Research Council. So the, the, uh, it was a place where uh, the equipment for teaching science in schools was tested out. So schools would know if it was any good before they bought it. And that was done on a national basis at CERC and Dunfermline. But they've spread their wings rather like EMEC have got into hydrogen, CERC have got into running the STEM ambassadors scheme um, uh, from Edinburgh. And uh, what, what are STEM ambassadors? Well, they're engineers, people like me and you that are interested in STEM and want to help, uh, want to help teachers. So you have talked about supporting the teachers. Um, particularly with careers information in, this, in, the, uh, in the secondary sector. Another reason why firms might be interested in their staff becoming STEM ambassadors is because it, it makes the 
it makes the staff more engaged in the world in and the firm that you're with feel more part of the world it's not just working in its own silo you're working as part of the community so your staff feel more engaged with you and your firm um so there's benefits to your to your own firm directly obviously the public become more aware if you if you if your folk go out to schools and say i do this for shell and this is this is this is why shell is great and this is why the job the work we're doing is important then then that's good for your for your your organization and in the distant future obviously there'll be more people to employ more people to apply for jobs in the short in the very short term of if you're needing to get an apprentice what better way than to have gone into a school and talk about your work and get the uh, the top people in the in the class to have you in their sights um what does the uh, stem ambassador get out of signing up for the scheme um well crucially you get free uh, pvg that's uh, protection of vulnerable groups you get a certificate basically to say that you've been uh, check that you're not a paedophile or not a known paedophile in the system um, they also give you induction training um, which is largely about safeguarding um, which is not so not to uh, to safeguard the children it's more to safeguard yourself um, and uh, i can summarize that as uh, never get into a situation which looks compromising it's not it's an issue of whether anything has gone wrong it's a case of has it can you prove to the world that it hasn't gone wrong um so there's some good tips about that that uh, that you get from the from the training and you get insurance um as long as you've uh, you've registered your activities with the scheme beforehand then you're covered with insurance which is a, a good uh, load off your mind although i must say i don't think about it anymore i just get on with it um if you're uh, an employer and you're interested you can get your own handbook and leaf through it and this will this will support you to see why an employer and how an employer could get involved and uh, help their employees to sign up. I know I had some success getting EMEC people to do this uh, a few years ago, so quite a few STEM ambassadors um, out of EMEC. How does it work and how, how might it work in Orkney? Well, this is the way it's supposed to work and it doesn't work this way at the moment in Orkney. The way it's supposed to work is this is this is me logging on as an ambassador and it 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 tells me what activities are on near me and i've put in myself as being in orkney and it shows you what things what stem what requests there have been for stem ambassadors so the idea is that a school uh, in say or would this be peterhead out here um a school out here wants a STEM ambassador, so they put in a, a request saying, we've got this event on, can a STEM ambassador come and help us and talk about, I don't know, medical equipment or renewable energy or something like that. And then the STEM ambassadors every so often go on and they have a look and they say, oh, I could do that. And they, they sort of get themselves networked together like a sort of dating organization. So. But as you see, it doesn't work in Orkney, so there's nothing on in Orkney. That doesn't mean that no teachers want any support in Orkney. It means that they've not been, we've not got it going in Orkney as a functioning enterprise. So I would guess, and I don't know this, Neil might know this, if you were to ask the, the uh, EMEC people who signed up to be ambassadors, how did it work out for them? I would guess they said, bit disappointing really because never got to do anything um but it would be really good if we could get it working so that there was a pool of ambassadors in orkney and the schools knew that if they put up a request then somebody would come and say oh hey we can help you with this 
So that would be really good if we could get this working or not. And it would mean that the uh, the sort of administration of it is all being done by SARC for us um, from Edinburgh, and they're paying for the administration of it and functioning of it. So that's how the STEM ambassador scheme can and should work. Um, if you go back to that booklet here, the employer handbook, here's a page out of it. It, it says, well, what things can you do to, uh, to push the STEM agenda? And you see there's quite a lot of different things you can do. It's not, it's not, it's not just um, running a STEM competition, which is what everybody thinks is the way to do it. I've mentioned careers, and here's a careers talk, which that sounds deathly boring, doesn't it? Well, whenever I've been asked to go and do a careers talk, I always take some gizmos along with me, some uh, some bits and pieces to show people, get them interested, um, and uh, I think that's the way to do it. You don't you don't tell them what salary you get or how many or grades you need to get into it. I don't think that's really an interesting way of doing a career talk but what you can say is hey this is this is what i did today and this is what i'm doing tomorrow and here's an exciting picture of me in a jet plane or down a well or something like that and incidentally they'll realize that an ordinary person who's standing in front of them actually actually can do these interesting things and maybe i could do that too um if you ask primary kids what they want to be um, in Orkney, I guess they want to be farmers or fishermen because that's what their uh, what their parents do. Um, how could they how could they aspire to be be a a wave energy specialist unless they know what that what that means? So if a wave energy energy specialist could come into the school and talk to them, they would see that a wave energy specialist looks very like them. Um, and talks in the same sort of way as them. And, oh, I could be, I could be that. Um, so I've got demonstrations there, you see, it's just to me the same as giving a careers talk. I get a lot of requests for the speed networking, which is sort of careers speed dating, where you set up a whole uh, row of, um, of desks and uh, kids get one minute at each place and they move along to the next desk and they speak to, they speak to EMEC and they speak to uh, somebody's plumbing and they speak to somebody else and they can get a few minutes. Personally, it doesn't, doesn't do much for me that, but uh, it's a way in school, if it's popular with schools, um, what will I say? Is Nothing really else. I think you could pretty obvious. Oh, site visits. Yes, I can talk about that. That seems an obvious thing to do. Um, fairly hard for schools to set up a site visit, um, but it's really good fun. Um, you just get gets the kids to come around and see around your place of work and show them your toys and uh, give them a day out of day out of school. Um, if you do that. Uh, the school will want you to take a class because schools are organized in classes and timetabled in classes and uh, the uh, a class of of uh, children is probably too many to show around a normal workplace so you probably want to think of taking the class and splitting them into groups of say eight maybe three groups from the class so split them into groups and then have three people to show them around in different places at different times um, to sort of do the, the classroom management. Uh, the other thing is to keep an eye on safety because a, a normal workplace is not childproof. So you want to look for uh, the welding equipment lying on the floor that you can trip over and just sort of plan your route a wee bit. So a wee bit of health and safety is required. Um, what the kids get out of a site visit is quite interesting. Um, when I took kids around my factory in Edinburgh, the one with the uh, with the airplanes and a stick outside, what made most impact on them was having their lunch in the canteen. 
and they were surprised i think that it was it was sort of restaurant style stuff it wasn't school dinners um but they got a, they got this atmosphere of engineers being ordinary people who came along and they sat down and they had a chat about the football and and uh, they didn't throw food at each other and the place was tidy and people had a pride in the place and they went back after their uh, after, you know there was no bell they just they just got up and they left and they went back to their work um so kids will get something out of site visit that maybe isn't just so obvious um as kids do i remember um a primary school in edinburgh from uh, this is uh, quite near where i live at wester hills and it's it's a it's a it's a deprived area although it's only four miles from my house um and the primary school teacher is very interested in STEM, and he took his class to Torness to see around the nuclear power station there. Great, great trip. And afterwards, he, he's speaking to one of the kids back at the school and said, what did you think about it? What was the most interesting thing about that? And the uh, child said, it was really interesting to see all these people with jobs because where the, the society that child lived in was, everybody was unemployed and they hung around in street corners. They didn't have jobs. So just to go to a place where everybody was sitting, doing a job and being paid for it was, that's what struck him about Dorness. So kids will get something out of it, but not necessarily what you expect. So, Okay, um, I was knocking doing STEM challenges, but nevertheless, a lot of people do them and uh, and uh, ORF have been trying to set up a STEM challenge, the Blythe challenge last year. And it wasn't the only one that got zero entries in the uh, science festival list of competitions. So, so don't feel too aggrieved about that. But suppose you do want to um, to promote the STEM agenda by putting a challenge out to schools, then uh, how do you go about it? What are you looking for? Well, this is what I th think is the way to, to think about it, what to start with. Um, you want to have something which is success is determined by the real world, as it is in any engineering task. You build a bridge, it falls down because of gravity, not because there's a rule that says if you exceed this this number, then that's you know you get a you get a bad mark. Um, it's it's physics and the real world that, that you're having to deal with. Even if you're just making a model, it should be determined not by the look of the model, but whether it works or not in some sort of a way. Um, when you set up the challenge, you've got a pretty good idea yourself as to how you would solve it. Otherwise, you don't. You, otherwise, you don't know it is actually soluble. But try and make sure that you don't force that onto the children. That you give them lots of different ways of doing things. So, um, at Yes, we we give people kits. Along with the challenge, we give them a kit so that they don't have to go and buy their own matches. Um, but we don't give them a kit of stuff that you just assemble. It's not a self-assembly kit. It's a kit of materials, which you can use these materials or any other materials that you like. But the way you use them is, is up to you. The materials are just a sort of inspiration starting point. And inevitably, kids do things differently from what you expect and that of course is a success that's just what you're looking for um open-ended i've sort of said this already the outcome isn't determined by opinion of the judges um the kids can see this um now it's got to be simple enough that everything works a little bit because 
there's nothing more dispiriting. And uh, if you've ever done this as a teenager, as I did, you build your electronics kit. It takes you a long time to solder it all together and then nothing happens. And that's a real down of that. So for goodness sake, let's make sure there's some sort of success for everybody. Um, but nevertheless, people can see some are better than others. And it's not a, it's not a, and a matter of opinion because everybody understands a bit of competition. And uh, I think kids love it. They love competition. I don't think it's bad for them. It is it's not bad for engineering either for there to be competition. Um, remember that you're not going in there to say, hey, schools are doing all this wrong. This is the exciting stuff here. You're supporting the teacher. So you're trying to weave in what the teacher is doing and show that it's relevant. So you show a graph and then in the way I did at the beginning, I was showing you that uh, maths is relevant to uh, what you go out and do in the world. Graphs are really good, but how many people actually draw a graph? How many, how many, how many people have ever drawn a graph of what's in their bank balance against, against the day of the month? Nope, but I'm sure it would be really quite, uh, quite illuminating. Teamwork. Um, I reckon this is why, why we send children to school, apart from the efficiency of it. If you're stuck at home and you have to do everything by remote, by remote learning, the thing that you really miss is the teamwork, isn't it? And yet, it, when you leave school and you go into the world of work, we just accept that naturally that's the way the world is. You work in teams. Uh, you, you, uh, the folk who came to install my heat pump, uh, about six people descended in my house and they all did different things. They digging up the road and uh, doing the wiring and uh, getting the computer a bit to work and soldering the pipes and they work as teams. So we know in the world of work, we know about teamwork. Um, so a STEM challenge should really try and get kids to work together as a team. And so you want to think of different aspects of the job and make sure that uh, you provide ways in which people can uh, collaborate because you're introducing them to careers and work. Okay, here's a couple of couple I prepared earlier to, uh, to show you the sorts of things that I've done to, to, uh, to practice what I preach. So this was in 2018. Um, and look, Neil was paying for this. Who else did we have? We've got uh, an insurance firm there, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Molly Lind, that's uh, an Orkney, Orkney charity. And uh, developing the young workforce, that's an aspect of skills development. So yeah, they all chipped in some money. And we gave every school that was interested, got one of these cars. Um, good fun. But you have, to, you have to do something with the car. You can't just play with it. So what, what, what we got them to do was to measure how far the car went on one charge, which proved to be quite challenging, actually. Um, so there was plenty of, uh, I think, science and engineering in that. It was just to measure how far the car went. I mean, don't think the cars go in a straight line very easily, for example. Um, and do you just do it once or do you do it many times? Really quite a lot. And then you have to write a report, don't you, to say what, what, the, what the answer was. Um, so quite a lot of good engineering just in doing the measurement. And Clearly, I was getting over the renewable uh, renewable energy um, brief as well there, wasn't I? So um, that's now I've gone back a year. Here was the year before. Here's the people I nobbled. Solo have changed their name to something else now, but they're still around. Um, I think, by the way, that it's really important to involve um, firms, not just to get their money, but to get them in as potential employers, 
to show that STEM is is a path into into worthwhile careers. So I look for sponsors, not just to bring their money, but to bring their bodies as well, um, to bring their name. And I think it's really important um, to access this, and I'll go into this a bit more detail later, to have a very local aspect to a project like this. I think people are more likely to take part in it as well as the more likely to support it financially. Anyway, that was a, what, what was this about? This was, um, I gave everybody, everybody two solar panels and got the kids to measure the output during the day. But what, what they did was they fixed one panel to face south and the other one they turned to track the sun. So every hour or up to them, how often they did it, they would go out and they would align one panel to face directly to the sun. Imagine it's on a turntable and you're moving it round, and you have this one that's, say, fixed uh, in the way all the other um, solar panels in the world are organised. And the question was, would you get more out of, a, out of a solar panel by rotating it to face the sun? And uh, you get a different answer for that, obviously, in Orkney than you do in the south of England. Because quite a lot of the time in Orkney, the sun's coming from behind the panel. Uh, so that was some good fun. Um, I thought there was good science in that. Now, now we get on to our own fun bit here. So um, some of you have volunteered. I'm going to stop sharing this. Some of you have volunteered and should have your own STEM challenge. So if you have, if you have one of these in the post, now is the time to take it out. Do we have anybody who agrees that they indeed have one of these? Janice, have you got one there? Oh yeah, anybody else got one? No? Yes, okay. So we're going to have a one minute STEM challenge of our own here. Um, so from these Lego bits, what you're asked to do is, I'm going to ask you, you've got one minute to do this and then we'll all compare with each other. If we're doing this in a, in a room, what, what, what I say is no kicking. So you're not allowed to look what anybody else is doing. And the job is to say, the challenge is to say, using these bits here, can you, I better get my timer here. Can you make me a duck in one minute? Okay, so you've got one minute to make me a duck out of that Lego. All right, I'm timing you now, that's 10 seconds gone. So you don't have to use all the bits, use as many bits as you can, or as you want to do. It's open-ended. Um, it's determined by physical constraints because you've only got these bits to work on. And that's 30 seconds up to making a duck. And as I say, you're not supposed to look at other people because you know, we don't want you copying anybody else's duck. We want to see if you can make up your own duck. You see, Neil, if you'd volunteered beforehand, you'd have got one of these in the post and you could be joining <laughs> in the fun now. Now I'm going to ask you to show us all your duck uh, in uh, 10 seconds time, to see how well you got on. So hopefully, everybody else will be able to see as well. I'm not sure if Neil knows how to make sure that we can see the particular person. Maybe if the, if you speak, you, you get, you, you come up big, do you? So anybody got one to show us? A duck? I've got one. All oh, right. Oh yeah, I get you there, yes. Okay, one, two, I used all the bits. Oh, wings, yes, right. And Janice has got one too. Janice, I think if you unmute and speak, I think we'll see you big, big screen. Well, yes. Minus absence of wish. Ah, <laughs> right. Okay. Yes, it's a tail. It's got a red tail there. Yes. Okay. Well, I, well, yeah. Well, I did have at least a tail, and then I thought it didn't look right. Yes. Yes. Right. So, Anybody else? So I changed it and made it the beak. Ah, it right. What's the yes. tail? Yes. Then I changed it. I thought, oh, it needs a beak. Okay. Now, here's, 
here's a couple I, I, I prepared earlier, right? So I can show you one here, Dave. I've got oh, one. Oh yeah, please. Oh yeah, I've got one there. Gavin, so yes, holding, right. Holding yes. his tail. There we go. All right. Yeah. Three. Anybody else? Right. As I say, here's here's a couple. Here's a couple here that I've got um, prepared earlier. There's a, that's a bit like the uh, the one with the wings. That, and here's another one here. That, uh, now, so the what's the point of this? Now, um, like any uh, of these STEM tricky things, the point is whatever you want to make of it. Um, the way I use it is to say, um, engineering is a creative process. Because one of the jobs I had as an engineer, one of the job titles I had was I was a quality engineer. And from the point of view of a quality engineer, quality assurance, really important that I learned that the quality assurance wasn't about making gold-plated rolls rices. It was making sure that requirements were met. Not that everything was perfect and as I say a gold plated Rolls Royce. So if we were to look at all those models that we just saw and say the requirement was make a duck. How many people achieved the requirement? And the answer is of course everybody. You could say all of these were recognizably ducks. So from the point of view of a STEM challenge, a degree of success for everybody. Was it open-ended? Yes, it was, because everybody did it differently. And the, the, what I say is, look, if you think engineering is boring because it's all constrained and you know there's, there's, there's a right answer and you just assemble things in the right way and that's, that's it. Absolutely, it is not. How many different ways do you think there might be of assembling that Lego? Do just those six bits to make a duck? And the answer is hundreds of different ways. Um, and uh, then if you say, well, how many different ways would there be of making a watch? And, uh, you know, goodness me, it's hard to bear thinking about. Um, how many different ways are there of making a wave energy machine? Well, nobody's got the right answer yet, have they? But uh, the, uh, the answer is multiple infinities. So, the, the, the notion that engineering isn't creative, I think, is uh, completely knocked on the head by a little demo like that. So that was just my bit of fun. Um, and uh, also, uh, I could go back to my slides now. So that's what we had to do. And if I go back now, what would I say? How many of these boxes did I tick? Of course, as with any engineering project, you can't tick all the all the boxes at the same time. You can't have what is it? You can't have the budget and the time scale and the uh, success uh, all at the same time. But we can have a few of them. So I think we could say that was a natural constraint. It was certainly open ended. Don't know about the physical laws here. Success for everybody, yes. No, I don't think we showed the relevance of school learning. Teamwork, absolutely not. Didn't do that at all in that, in that, in that case. Right, okay, so um, now um, a warning, a warning. Um, people get enthusiastic about STEM and how you find a little STEM project like that Lego duck. Um, obviously you go on the internet, you see what people are are uh, are doing and you you copy them um there was a time uh when i was working when if you said you had got an idea off the internet people would tut and schools used to say oh you shouldn't do things you shouldn't do your uh, research on the internet but i think nowadays um you would get a black mark for not researching the internet to answer any question by all means, look at look at books and everything else. But if you say, I've looked everywhere, but I've never looked on the internet, then really you're not doing your job properly, whatever it is you're trying to make. So if you're trying to, um, to get a good uh, STEM demonstration or something, of course, you're going to go on look on the internet. Uh, but you will find some perfectly well-meaning instances of bad science. And um, 
take care with it. Take care that you don't go into schools with your uh, uh, to help people and actually do harm. What is it doctors say? Uh, you may not do any good, but make sure you don't do any harm. Um, Google said that as well, didn't they? Can't remember. Anyway, so here's here's a here's an example close to your heart, no doubt. The greenhouse effect. Um, and here's somebody's illustration of how it works. Look, it's obviously they, they know something about it because the uh, the light from the sun uh, with a relatively short wavelength comes in, and the infrared heat from the plants is coming up with a longer wavelength, and they've got that bit right too. And that's exactly what happens on the earth, of course, and that's what's called the greenhouse effect. But it ain't how greenhouses work. If you really thought that was how a greenhouse worked, then you would notice that you don't need to keep the door shut. But that isn't how greenhouses work. If you open a door in a greenhouse, all the hot air blows out and it's cold inside. What the, what the glass in the greenhouse is actually doing is stopping convection, stopping a draft and trapping the hot air that way. So this, this is just wrong. It is, it looks plausible, but no, I'm sorry, it is just wrong. Um, now, here's another one. I've actually tried this myself. Um, uh, don't really want to criticize that particular organization. It just happens to be the one that is propounding it. Well-meaning, but wrong. Um, the idea here is you can weigh air and show that a full balloon with air in it weighs more than an, an uninflated balloon. And it's probably true, isn't it, that uh, this has more mass than that. Um, if you go and try this, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's not surprising it doesn't work. Uh, I won't go into the, all the ins and outs of it, but uh, the whole thing is in air. So this is bigger, but it gets more flotation. It's actually floating in the air. Uh, so you've got more than one thing going on at the same time. So if you are picking up things off the internet and say that's, that, that's a really good, that's a really good uh, demonstration, then just be careful. Be careful that you know yourself what, what it is and you've checked it out. Right, okay, now, um, so you're going to go in, uh, into schools and you want to get the schools engaged. Now, one of the things I said earlier, I'll go back to where I was, because I missed this point. Here we go, right. Teachers are expert organizers, I said. Now, what the point I'd missed making there is that teachers have got the children. They don't have time and they don't have the money. And you have a bit of time and maybe a bit of money to prepare your STEM stuff, but you don't have any children. So you can have the most marvelous ideas in the world, but you can't, you can't do anything with them unless you can get into a school. The teachers control the access to the children. In particular, the head teachers. So, if you want to do STEM, you need the children, and therefore you need the head teachers. They control the access. So, where was I? I was about to say. Right. So now you're trying to get into a school. So you send off, you punt off an email to the school, or you put a flyer into the office, and. If you were to go to a school office and see all the stuff that comes in for their attention, you can see you're going to have to shout quite loudly because the job of a school office is very much like the job of a, what, a receptionist and a, and a doctor's filtering out the things. Here's all the things that schools are supposed to do nowadays. Um, every day, there's something that schools should be teaching, or I mean, I'm not going to say any, any of these things are cranks. They're all perfectly legitimate ideas, but every day there'll be something a school ought to do, something as well as their ordinary curriculum. They should be doing this and that and the next thing, or they should be um, taking part in, in that, 
or somebody was trying to sell them more books or more equipment or or whatever you know so obviously all this stuff has to go in the bucket because you can't possibly read it all so schools are inundated with offers of help um so you can't just pop your idea on an envelope and hand it into the school office and expect to get an answer so um you have to you have to make your offering stand out you've got to do a bit of marketing um you've got to make sure that it comes to the attention of school and that's where this local aspect comes in that i mentioned earlier i found you're much more likely to get the school to pay attention if you're locally based um i mean what better for a, for a primary school than to get um parents of children at that school to come in and talk about their jobs and they're far more likely to get a yes yes please than uh, than somebody uh, from elsewhere so you've got a hard job to get the school to pay attention to you to get access to the children um so it's not easy and think about how to do it and head teachers i think are the key here to to how you go about it um here's somebody here you ought to know about um part of the stem seed in orkney um the wood foundation um spending their black money remember so it comes from oil doesn't it and uh they're investing this in a program that they call RAISE, Raising Aspirations in Science Education. It's, it's directed at helping primary schools uh, to look. I mentioned that primary school teachers can't be expected to know a lot about science. So it's, it's a way of trying to help them with the science aspects of it. And so the Wood Foundation are funding somebody in each local authority area to be seconded and Colin Nisbet here he was seconded from Kirtwell Grammar School for a year uh, to become a, a education support officer full-time on in STEM away from school um, so there's his email he lives up the road at Koilu um, and if you want to know anything about who's who in the schools in Orkney He's your man. He's only in, he's only in post guaranteed until the end of March, uh, but at least until then, um, he is a great way into schools in Orkney. Um, he's got uh, various ways into him. Set up a STEM organisation. He's got to have a badge and things. He's, he's obviously he's obviously been 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 very busy this year. Um, but yes, he's doing a great job. I know that because he's, he's done a lot for me as well. So that's that's another important aspect. Um, if you're uh, if you're looking at the primary schools in Orkney, it's quite a number of primary schools. Um, they vary hugely in the size. That's and of course a lot of them are on islands. It's one of the unique features of Orkney. Um, so. If you're approaching these schools, you're going to have to do it differently or expect to be handled differently, depending on what school it is. If it's a school with only 12 pupils, then probably you'll be speaking to the whole school. Um, if it's a school, if it's Papdale, um, you'll be teaching, you'll be interacting with a class of 30. So you'll need 30 of whatever it is you're going to hand out to the kids to, to make. Um, so you'll know in advance roughly what to expect if you're going to a big school they might like you they might like you to go back um so that all the all this all the pupils in the same year get a chance at whatever it is you're offering um and if you're going to uh to uh, papa westry you'll have a bit of traveling to do unless you do it remotely interesting enough Orkney um, from the point of view of education in Scotland Orkney is categorized as 
very remote rural. That is that is its category. Unless you're in Kirkwall, which case you're a very remote small town. Um, I don't suppose you're too surprised, although it might be a bit of a surprise to think that from the point of view of Scottish education, Papa Westray is equally remote to Stromness. So that's an interesting aspect to it. But it does mean if you want to get a grant for anything, then it's the urban rural thing you want to push in Orkney. And uh, that's a huge aspect, I think, to how you should bang the stem drum in Orkney. Um, right, this is the last slide you'll be glad to know. I think it is anyway. Um, so what things are coming up? These are our ways into schools, because schools like to hook onto these uh, events and uh, they become aware of them and that gives them a reason to do something, something specific for STEM. So British Science Week, quite a few schools will be interested in doing something for that. What they do is they get, they can, they can write away for a grant and get a free kit, um, but an opportunity for uh, ORAF people to say, hey, let's do something for British Science Week. It's not that long away. Just, just uh, get your local school and say, would you like something or invent something and go to the school and say, I've got an idea. How would this do for British Science Week? Um, what's the next up in uh, date order? We've got this is the this is our this is the young engineers idea. This is we have these celebrations across the country. We've never had one in Orkney yet, so we're hoping to run one in June here. And what happens is you get a team from each school to come together, hopefully in King Street halls and uh, set up our table and show off what they've been doing that year. And then judges come around and see who's been doing the most exciting STEM things. Now, I'm looking for volunteers for that because what we need uh, as part of this celebration is we set up um, a number of three minute challenges. So we get local firms to take a table and man it. And at that table, there is a three minute challenge, which embodies all the good things I mentioned earlier, uh, teamwork and something relevant to the firm. So if you're into solar panel installation, maybe you've got some solar panels there and uh, the kids have to do something in three minutes with the solar panel. Um, and so you'll get, uh, you'll get five or six kids come along, you tell them what to do, they've got three minutes to do it, you give them a mark out of 10, and you, you, you say, oh, you did this well, and you didn't do that so well, and this is what is to do with, uh, with the, the, the real world of work. And then they toddle off to the next one and you get another group in. So we're looking for local people in Orkney um, to take a table and put on something which um, will, inspire them into the world of work. So we're looking for firms and organizations, whether it's a university or a, or Thaw or a EMEC or something like that, um, put on something which shows people that um, what you're doing is interesting and you, you're interested in them. So there I'm looking for volunteers and uh, I'll give you my email in a moment and you can, fire in and say, we'd like to know more about this. And, uh, don't forget that, please. Right, the next thing, the Science Festival. Um, that's probably the biggest link between STEM and schools in Orkney. So you certainly want to think about that um, as a platform to engage with, with uh, children in a STEM way. Um, because all the schools in Orkney are receptive. They're all looking out for what they're going to do during the Science Festival. So that is a really important um, milestone in the next year. And then following that, you've got this Maths Week Scotland. So again, um, particularly specialist maths teachers will be feeling, hmm, and this will this will just be in uh, Stromness Academy in Kirkwall. They'll be thinking, hmm, we should really be doing something for Maths Week. So 
if you were to phone them up and say, hey, we've got a thing for maths week. Um, we've got, you know, we can come in and do a thing with making a graph and it'll take an hour. You'll probably get a yes, which is, is, which is your passport into the school. The, uh, the, the trap door will be opened for you. The portals will be opened. So there's some, some hooks to get into schools. Um, now, lastly, yes, this is the last slide, yes, because uh, I was showing some of this to my wife, who is an ex-English uh, teacher, and uh, she said, what a load of bollocks that is, all that official sort of stuff you've been you're going on about there. What's really important about STEM is to have some fun. Uh, so I think, actually, she's quite right about that, and that is really important, is uh, that... Uh, we're not there to to uh, drone on about careers and tell people what their duty is. Um, what's important is the kids have a lot of fun out of this and they realize that STEM is interesting and useful, but it's fun. So it's something that they want to be involved with. And it's got to be something that you enjoy. That's the real thing, isn't it? Because if you're enjoying it, um, the kids will see that you're enjoying it and you're there because you're enjoying it. And so the whole thing uh, just becomes good for everybody. So um, keep it simple and have, have good fun doing it. And I promised you that I would show you my email address so you can get in touch and uh, say, I've got an idea, I want to help, or uh, I, I want your help with this, because yes, yes isn't just there to um, do its own thing. Yes is there to help employers to uh, to engage with STEM. So if you've got an idea, then I'm here to to help you make it make it happen. Right, there you go. I promised you it would come to an end and indeed it has. Dave, thanks very much indeed for that. That was uh, very interesting. Um, uh, very interesting well, particularly to see some of those dates coming up um, in the year because I don't know about anybody else, but I'm constantly surprised about the fact that you think, oh, I wish I'd known that was on early enough. Could have done something about that. So at least we've got some lead time now. So my, my sincere thanks for that. Um, so uh, that was a, a, a very useful tour around what's, what's going on. Um, and I really appreciate the, the uh, time that went into that. Have we got any particular questions that anybody's come up to wants to um, pose anything? I've generally muted people. Um, um, uh, when they when they came into the room, so um, if you did want to chip in and ask a question, then we've got sort of a uh, quarter of an hour or so before we call the meeting to a halt. Any particular thoughts anybody's got? A stunned silence, Dave. A stunned silence. Oh, Cara. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, got you. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, so we've we've just recently moved to Orkney and my partner is actually a science teacher in uh, will be as of tomorrow in Kirkwall Grammar School. My children are studying in Stromness um, for my involvement in STEM ambassadorships previously, uh, which were mostly down uh, either in the northeast of England or around Edinburgh. Um, where you have these big science events, if you can engage with the secondary school, they're kind of feeder primary schools, they already have that um, sort of interaction with those schools. So it could be quite a good way, especially for the more organized events um, to kind of engage with more people, um, perhaps to just one initial school. And sorry, interruption in the background. Um, yeah, there's, there's some really good ideas though. And I think, um, yeah, we'll probably get our heads together, Neil, and have a think about what we might be able to what are you teaching to some of these things? What do you what are you going to teach at Cutwell? Um John in the background there, he'll be teaching science. He's a biology specialist All right. for secondary. <laughs> yeah, Caroline, that'd be good to um to get together. Caroline just uh, joined EMEC uh, yesterday. So there we go. Um now just just to comment there, uh, Caroline, biology is underrepresented in the STEM field. Maths is also underrepresented people, but most things seem to involve making things like, like Lego ducks. Um, and so I do feel that, that there's a, a big opportunity to do a bit more biology. And there's a lot of farming going on in Orkney and fishing too. So I, I can see a real, 
a real need to involve biology in that. So there's a thought. Yeah. Well, John's degree, um, one of the things he did was went and counted limpets, I think, or whelks or something on a beach for uh, weeks <laughs> one summer. Um, and I know there was obviously the, the seaweed survey that went on earlier in the year. So I'm sure uh, I'm sure he'll come up with some ideas to bring to the table as well. Yeah. I've got one point I just wanted to uh, put over. Um, we've tried to engage a couple of times with STEM well, I, during my career, and quite often it's um, it, it's quite hard to work out how to calibrate the activity against the age group. So I just wondered if there were any good guides around or anybody's got a YouTube channel about showing some bits and pieces just to try and help people calibrate themselves to make sure they don't turn up with something that's so simple for the age group that the, the kids look, just, I think you're being patronising, or similarly, it's it's too advanced and, and they, they they can't latch and, and engage with it. And I just wondered if there was anything particular there to try and suggest anything, particularly with these forthcoming events, as to sort of the likely age groups that one is likely to see at these sorts of things. Any yeah. Questions? Okay, well, I'll take my own ideas and other people may have their own ideas as well. Um, I would say it's very hard to be too simple. Um, so most of the STEM ambassadors I see um, start out being far too complicated and using words that are much longer than necessary. <laughs> um, so that's different from being patronizing um, and uh, talking down to the class is different from making it simple. So try and make it simple. And as a teacher, uh, it's often been said, not this isn't just me, but um, you only learn something properly when you have to teach it because you simplify it and you work out what is actually really important yourself. Um, I think so you put across something really simple in a classroom um, and the kids um, get most out of noticing, I don't know, what you're wearing or something like that. Just your presence being there and calling yourself an engineer or a scientist or whatever it is, uh, is probably the most important thing. It's just an ordinary person has come in and said, I'm a scientist, um, I do this and they go away and that sort of implants in their mind that maybe science is a respectable occupation. You don't just have to be an engine driver or, or a footballer. Um, another thing I would say is uh, be guided by the teacher. So Oops, we lost David. So if you, the teacher oh. help you with, since tonight I spoke. Oh, sorry. sorry, we lost you there for okay. a moment there, Dave. Sorry, you go. Yes, okay. Um, yes, okay. So I, I've sort of had a monologue, didn't I, for more than an hour. So um, if you get an interaction going involving the teacher, the teacher will calibrate things automatically for you. Um, so you'll, you'll sort of latch on to what the kids expect. Um, also, you've got my email, and that's that's sort of my reason for existing is uh, to help you to do that sort of thing. And uh, so, if you have an idea, please drop me an email, and I can suggest how to put it over or review your idea and go over you or go over the words that you're going to use and say, hey, look, maybe you could do this in uh, fewer words or with shorter words or more ordinary words, perfectly correct words, but just more straightforward words. Um, yeah, so really important, I think, Neil, that you don't, you don't uh, go in and um, make things look very complicated and difficult and unattainable. You want, you want kids to feel, hey, I could do that. Yeah, I, I could, I could draw a graph. Goodness me, isn't that amazing? I could help here. I could change the world because I could go and draw graphs for Neil Carbord. Interesting idea. I think you're slightly over ascribing my, uh, my capacities <laughs> there, but however, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, okay. Um, anybody else want to chip in? 
I'm seeing no movement or frankly scurrying noises for looking for the mute button. So no, okay, good. In that case, I'll, 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 I'll draw us to a close and sort of say, thanks for actually indeed for um, uh, bringing this up. But it is fundamentally important. Um, I think um, I know of some of the people on the on the call here today who've all had the benefit of being inspired by somebody at some point to really want to um, uh, push on with education and find ways to order their particular piece of the world, which to my mind is the definition of a science or, or, or an engineering expert, somebody who's in seeking to impose order either physically or mentally on the chaos that's around them. Um, and um, I, I think it's been really useful to bring this back to the fore. Um, there've been a number of initiatives um, over the years, which have obviously led us to our various places. I think we've obviously got a duty to try and inspire others to um, probably do a better job of things than, than, than we cumulatively, cumulatively are managing as per your original graph. Um, I think it was really useful to, uh, to, to show the whole point about the, the, the importance of a good simple challenge to get people engaged and get people uh, motivated. So I hope people will remember the, the, the points that, that you've been making today. Um, this event, say so we're recording it and it'll be up on the ORF website. Um, and so we would seek to try and drive traffic to it and, and get people to, to look at it later on. Um, and I do think from an ORF board point of view, we'd be really keen to hear from any ORF members or indeed prospective members about any ideas they might have to try and um, better engage on the on science basis. They've given us uh, four events that are coming up. And I know many of us do engage with the Science Festival, but certainly I wasn't aware of the other three. So um, I certainly would like to do something to, um, to, to get more engaged in that, and I'm sure others would as well. So, um, Without any further ado, I would just say once again, Dave, thank you so much for putting your time in uh, for, for taking us through that this evening. Thanks to everybody who attended. Um, and uh, let's go out there and try and change the world for the better. Thanks for your day, everybody, and uh, good night. Thank you. Cheers, Neil. Oh, small credit, a small, small trail. Um, we've got a thing on next Tuesday night about the EV strategy. Um, so the we wrote the EV strategy five years ago. It's up for its refresh. Um, we're having a, a gathering online again next Tuesday night to have a quick gallop through what we did last time um, and see if there are things that we missed or need to change. So if anyone's going on to that, same sort of drill, um, contact the office. They'll give you the, the link and uh, come on in. OK, really going now. Okay, Mark, did you want to say something? No, no, I was just saying cheers, Neil. Thank you. Yes. Okay. No, <laughs> so, okay. Bye. Bye. All the best. Bye. Bye.